Chapter 14 was another sizable chapter. We spent some time on the general senses, focusing primarily on nociception or pain. We then moved on to the special senses, each of which had its own organ that has a lot of anatomy and physiology that you should review. We also covered a fair number of diseases and conditions that helped to illustrate some of the basic physiology that we learned in this chapter. Activity-dependent receptor inactivation and activity-dependent receptor internalization were two mechanisms by which neurons could adapt to an unchanging stimulus. Some receptors, when exposed to a constant stimulus, will activate a second messenger pathway, which activates a kinase enzyme, which can phosphorylate those receptors. This induces a conformational change that makes them less capable of binding to their signal, hence inactivating. This phosphorylation may also target them for internalization. The active receptors can be brought inside of a vesicle and moved to the insides of the cell where they are no longer in contact with the outside stimulus. Either way leads to inactivation of the neuron. This type of neuron would be called a phasic neuron. For instance, pressure and smell are phasic, meaning the neurons will stop responding to a signal if it remains constant. For instance, you can't smell your own house or your own breath because those neurons have adapted to that signal. If the stimulus were to become larger, however, the neuron would begin to fire action potentials again. This allows for certain behaviors like chemotaxis. This neuron would only fire action potentials as we move closer to the source of a smell, not if we stay in place or move further away. Other neurons, like nociceptors, are tonic, meaning they will keep responding to a signal that is unchanging. Drugs that affect our sensory systems may work out at the dendrites, affecting the activity of neurotransmitter receptors. For instance, in the treatment of pain, analgesics can block the activity of receptors here at the dendrites. On the other hand, it's also possible to block the activity of voltage-gated sodium channels along the axon. In the example of pain modification, anesthetics typically work here. It's important to note that there's often more than one receptor type for any given neurotransmitter. In the case of opiates, there are mu, delta, and kappa opiate receptors, and different type of opiates may bind to these receptors differently. Morphine, for instance, preferentially binds to the mu opiate receptor, whereas oxycodone binds to the mu and kappa receptors. In the process of hearing, sound waves travel up the external auditory canal until they reach the tympanic membrane, causing this membrane to vibrate. This pushes on the malleus, incus, and stapes, which amplify the sound wave, and transmit it to the fluid found in the inner ear. Waves in this fluid will travel up the cochlea. Lower frequency waveforms traveling further, or more distal, than the higher frequency sound waves. They cross over from the vestibular to the tympanic duct, and where this occurs, this will cause the tectorial membrane to push down on hair cells, which can translate the sound wave into an electrical impulse which travels up cranial nerve 8 to the thalamus and eventually to the temporal lobes. The function of the pharyngotympanic tube is to make sure that the air pressure in the external ear matches that of the middle ear. It opens up to the nasal cavity. Sometimes the act of chewing can help open up this tube, making sure that the two air pressures are equal. When there is an imbalance in pressure, that makes it difficult for the tympanic membrane to vibrate properly, which inhibits our ability to hear, as well as causing discomfort or pain. 
The act of locating a sound requires activity in both ears. A sound wave from the right will activate the right cochlea before it activates the left cochlea. Binaural neurons in the brain can compare the signals from both cochleas to look for a phase difference to determine which side of the body the sound was emanating from. Similarly, the sound wave from the right will be filtered by the time it reaches the left ear. The auricles can help filter some of the higher frequencies out. We do not perceive the absent frequencies in the left ear versus the right. The brain interprets this information as direction. That is the perception. Even though the sensation happening in both cochleas is different. On center ganglia represent a special way that rods summate onto ganglion cells in the retina. The ganglion cell will only fire an action potential if the rod in the middle is stimulated, but the ones on the edges are not. If all of the rods were to fire action potentials, the bipolar cells on the edges would fire IPSPs onto the ganglion cell, thereby inhibiting its activity. This means this on-center ganglion cell will only fire an action potential at the border of an object where it switches from light to dark. There are also off-center ganglion cells which would fire action potentials when you switch from dark to light. They are just wired up in the exact opposite conformation. The optic chiasm represents a spot where half of the axons of each optic nerve cross to the other side of the brain. The left sides of both retinas connect to the left side of the brain, whereas the right sides of each retina connect to the right side of the brain. This means that the right field of view goes to the left side, and the left field of view goes to the right side. This is different from how other nerve fibers were connected to the brain. Usually it's the left side of the body that's connected to the right side of the brain. We also discussed the vestibulo-ocular reflex, where rotational information from the inner ear would direct the movement of the extrinsic eye muscles in the opposite direction. A rotation from the right would be detected in both semicircular canals of the right and left side and initiate movement of the eye muscles to the left so that they stayed focused on the same object. Damage to this reflex, either permanent or temporary, such as with alcohol usage, can lead to the condition nystagmus. This is where the brain mistakenly believes that it is rotating and tries to move the eyes to compensate. Papillae are bumps that are visible on the surface of the tongue. Taste buds can be found in the fungiform foliate and circumvolate papillae. Taste buds are responsible for the sensation of gustation. Taste, on the other hand, is a perception, which not only includes activity of taste buds on the tongue, but also temperature and nociceptors, the latter of which determine spiciness. The majority of taste actually reflects activity in the olfactory mucosa, Memory, sight, and a few other factors are also important in the perception of taste.